Okay, okay. Uh, welcome to the Mind Report. I am Lori Santos. I'm professor of psychology at Yale University, and today I'm talking with Kent Keel, professor of psychology, neuroscience, and law at the University of New Mexico, and uh, I have my lab in a nonprofit called the Mind Research Network. Cool. And today we're going to be talking about the neuroscience of psychopaths. Um, for those who have not seen it yet, Kent has just finished a fantastic new book. I have it here uh, called The Psychopath Whisperer, uh, The Science of Those Without Conscience. Um, I read it in a fast pitch. Um, it's perfect for summer reading because it's both kind of science memoir and kind of like discovery story and crime thriller and cognitive science all rolled into one, which is um, a rare treat. Um, so it should be fun to have Kent on to talk today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, so first question is kind of a personal one, which is like, you seem like a nice guy. I know you back when you were here at Yale. How did you know, a nice guy like you get involved with a bunch of psychopathic prisoners? Well, I, I think when I was, uh, there, was a, there was a point when in my education that I realized I needed to um, you know, make a decision about a career path. I mean, I think everyone goes through this. And I had a great mentor who uh, advised me to look at the academic um, possibilities of moving into a faculty line. And then she basically said the mo most successful faculty she knows are ones who get up every morning and they want to go study the thing that they love or they really have always been curious or fascinated by. And psychopaths have always been something that's just fascinated me. And um, it grows in part because, um, you know, Ted Bundy was a prolific serial killer in the 70s and he actually grew up down the street from me. And my dad was a writer. And he told us about this kid down the street who, you know, ended up doing all these bad things and how could that possibly happen. So it really kind of set the stage for when I was in school to think about, well, that would be something that would be great to just focus and study. And there's really nobody else. Um, there's a small space, if you will, yeah. of people who study these, these individuals. And I really felt that the, the science that we could do to help understand the condition, to help prevent, to help treat, to help develop something, that, that would be something that I would really like to do. So I... I been fortunate to make a career out of, of, of studying and working with psychopaths and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's been very interesting. So. Excellent. So before we get too, too far, why don't you give us kind of a, a definition of psychopath? Because I think what we hear about psychopathy in the media sure. and on TV is, is yeah. often wrong. Um, so like any psychiatric, you know, or psychological construct, um, you're only going to be as, as good as the assessment technique that you use. I actually went to graduate work specifically to work under the guy that developed, the professor that developed the, um, the best measure that's currently used in the, in the field. It's called the Hair Psychopathy Checklist. And basically an expert takes all of the background information about somebody, so information about family, um, criminal activity, of course, developmental issues, you know, problems with kids, adolescents, um, relationship histories, all the different types of things that you can get from their criminal files and other types of collateral sources. And then you interview the individual, which is the fun part. You get to interview them for, you know, one to three hours. Um, and from the, all that information, you score them on 20 criterion. And so you're looking for evidence of things like lack of empathy, lack of, of remorse. Um, and you look across all domains of their life. So you look to see if they have these problems at home, at work, at school, with family and friends. Um, and if they do, then you score them high, like a two out of, you know, it scores zero, Items doesn't apply to anybody. The, the content doesn't apply. One applies somewhat, or two definitely applies. And so there's 20 criterion that we use to assess um, psychopathy or this personality disorder that we're studying. And they're based on this expert rater device. So it takes quite a bit of time and energy and effort to do it. So there's, and there's really two domains. There's the interpersonal and affective domain, like superficial relationships. Um, they have, they're conning, manipulative. They lie a lot, often for no good reason. They have a lot of uh, poor responsibility. They often are nomadic. They move from place to place, relationship to relationship. They don't develop attachments. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of it is that they're also kind of chronically impulsive. And so they, um, they do things on the spur of the moment. They don't plan things very well. They often get themselves in trouble. Um, they often move on from one relationship to the other. And these two domains are the kind of, um, that are assessed with the symptoms that we study that. And that's how we assess psychopathic traits. And that's, that's you know, when someone scores really high, you know, in the top 10 percentile, then that's when we give them the label having psychopathy or being a psychopath. And then, you know, the uh, individuals who are medium or low are still, you know, medium could be still pretty problematic, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that's how they're, they're distributed. And so it, it really is one of those tests that takes a long time to do. Um, and it's, but the more carefully you assess the traits, the more likely you're going to find um, neuroscience relationships uh, to those traits. And so mm -hmm. 
Um, but those are the traits. Got it, got it. And just to be clear, a psychopath, sociopath, I mean, these terms kind of Yeah, come so up, they, but... they generally are assessing the same symptoms, but the sociopathic personality disorder was really a term coined in the behaviorist era of mm-hmm. psychology when we all thought you were a blank, blank slate. And so social forces could mold you to be, you know, have those traits or not. And we don't use that term anymore in, in mainstream psychology because we know that psychopathic traits can come from both um, social and biological or genetic uh, forces and likely an interaction between the two. And so the term psychopath is actually predated sociopath and is now really outdated with respect to its use. But they generally meant the same thing. So they would talk about the same person. Um, but the, 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 the definition of the etiology underlying the word is, is quite different. So we don't usually use sociopathic uh, personality disorder anymore. Got it, got it. And then the other thing that sometimes folks confuse is psychosis and psychopath. Yes. Right. Yeah, so psychosis is obviously where they're having a fragmentation of mental activity. So you have, uh, you're hearing voices, hallucinations, these so-called positive symptoms, you're disorganized, you know, you don't, uh, you get paranoid, et cetera. And there's also negative symptoms. So you have, you know, poor memory problems, cognitive control problems, et cetera. And that's a very different problem. Um, psychopaths usually never have those things, that you never see those problems. Um, they're, they're often cognitively intact, if you will. They don't have any types of delusions or hallucinations and stuff like that. So psychosis and psychopathy are are very different, but you're right, they're often confused. And one of the things that was kind of neat to see in your book is that I think there's sometimes this misconception that psychopaths um, have these cognitive problems, they're not really smart, but at least a lot of the folks you talked with, despite their impulsiveness and despite their social problems, like they're often relatively intelligent too, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, psychopaths are actually, um, they're, usually average to above average IQ, mm-hmm. um, which is often what leads it to be so surprising to family and parents and um, friends that they keep getting themselves in trouble or doing these things that get them in, in so much trouble with the law, um, or they make such poor decisions in business that, you know, and all these different dealings. And so that that is um, you know one of the kind of paradoxes of the condition is that they have good, I think, um, regular IQ or, or you know, IQ, but they actually, we've shown that they actually have low emotional IQ. Mm-hmm. So they actually don't make good decisions with respect to interactions with others and uh, emotional decisions about um, relationships and other types of things. They're really not guided by emotion, but their in- intellect is fine. Yeah. I think in the book, you call them a, walk- a walking oxymoron for that reason, right? Yeah. It did. Yeah. Like they shouldn't be doing, they shouldn't be getting into as much trouble as they are given their exactly. high IQs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so just in terms of demographics, like how, uh, how kind of popular is psychopathy out there in the world? Are our listeners like, likely to run into a psychopath? Are they likely to be a psychopath? Maybe. Prob- <laughs> well, maybe, but yeah. probably. Uh, so the, the base rate, you know, of those that score in that top percentile is really about um, one in 100, one in 150 men. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's fairly rare. It's similar to other types of mental illnesses that are, you know, chronic and severe um, and it's, it is a, a range, but again, you get a, a range of them. So mm-hmm. my favorite example is a good friend of mine. She said like, you know, I don't even want to date someone who scores in the 50th percentile, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, psychopathic trait. So, so the, the, we reserve the term psychopath for those that score in that very high range. Um, but you know, you could often see one, two, three, four, five percent, you know, of males might score in the moderate range. And that would be, you know, someone who you might want to, be careful around, et cetera, right, right, um, et right. cetera. But the really high scores are rare. But in prisons, um, we tend to find around the world that the rates of, uh, of psychopaths in prisons is much higher, uh, anywhere from 15% to 50%, depending wow. upon security classifications and other things. Psychopaths tend to get or congregate in high security facilities because they even get in trouble while they're in, in prison. Got it. So the security system tends to move them up there. So if you're studying them, you want to work with them and or get to the high security facilities in order to study them in, in decent numbers. And that was part of why in the book you kind of chronicle your years in grad school were spent a lot in a prison. I mean, many PhD students think that graduate school is a prison, but for you, graduate well, school really was a literally. prison. Yeah, I yeah, know. I, but I, again, it was just something that that's what I wanted to study. And that's where you have to go to study them. And, um, you know, we, I now have staff in eight prisons in two states. Um, so we're working in a wide variety of different facilities. Um, from medium security all the way up to sec- civilly committed individuals who are super dangerous. Um, and it's really about trying to use the best science to understand, best neuroscience to understand how individuals develop like this. And so we can try to develop uh, programs to minimize the chances that they'll be bad in the future. Yeah. And so when you really first started this stuff, I think in part because most of the high scorers are in prisons, there really wasn't much 
neuroscience work on them. Um, talk None. a little bit about like yeah. the path to doing neuroscience with prisoners. Sure. So, I mean, the thing that we first did and, and that there had been a history of doing this was to do EEG studies. So to take in, you know, brainwave recording equipment into the facilities and the inmates will volunteer to participate in those studies. Um, do you want to say a little we, bit about how EEG works just in case? Yeah. Works, so, yeah. you know, the brain is comprised of lots of different moving, you know, electrical currents. And so it's in a sense, it acts like a lot of little batteries. And so you can record with little sensors on the head uh, how those batteries are firing and functioning. So um, we've studied uh, the different brain waves that are associated with different types of emotional and intention and language you know, processes to understand the brain systems that might be different or impaired in individuals with psychopathy. So it's a very simple technique to use and to as mobile technique, if you will, mm-hmm. first mobile technique. But when we wanted to do brain imaging studies, we actually, over a four-year period, were able to transport from, well, not in my car, but the security, <laughs> the um, the prison uh, transportation system uh, that they move inmates around different prisons, they agreed to bring them from the maximum security prison to the university hospital and scan them. So we scanned about 50 inmates that way over four or five years. And that was what led to the first neuroscience studies. But um, it was a definitely an ordeal and it had a lot of extra security, a lot of, a lot of meetings with hospital security and, and prison security and um, the inmates did, and they loved it. I mean, they got to get out of jail for the day. You know, they're obviously shackled and stuff, but you know, we got to feed them a pizza and things that they enjoyed. And so um, it was really just about the a dedication by the Department of Corrections in Canada for trying to do the best science to help understand the condition. It was really a, it was really exciting um, when we were doing that work. And and did the prisoners, the psychopaths themselves, were they kind of weirded out by the fact that you're so interested in their brains? Were they kind of curious too? Like, how did they? You know, yeah. th- it's interesting that they, um, when you get them and you sit them down, because remember, they are very smart. They mm-hmm. often sit and they want to go, you know, like, as they get a little older, they get more insightful in terms of, um, you know, why did I end up doing all of this my whole life? And why did I end up in prison? Do they know their I diagnosis? Do, do they know that they're, what they're their score is? prisons. Yeah. In Canadian prisons, they're Psychopathy scores are done as part of a risk assessment because it predicts recidivism. Imagine you lack empathy, guilt, and remorse, and you're impulsive. Well, guess what? The higher you are in those traits, the more likely you are to reoffend. Mm-hmm. So it's a very big predictor of recidivism. And so they do know their scores, and they do know where they fit on those measures. They don't often like the label psychopath and things like that. So we use different terms in the prisons. The, the, the clinical teams use different terms. But, um, no, they often, frankly want to know why they're there and why they kept making bad decisions. And generally, they all say, if there was something, if I, I asked them, if there's something I could give you, like a pill or some sort of a strategy to help reduce the chances you'll come back to prison, would you take the pill or would you do the strategy? And they're like, of course, I don't want to be here. Hmm. And so they, they, they do, I think, um, want to understand what the problems they have and how they get there and, um, if possible, especially as they get older, they want to try to help prevent the chances that they're going to come back. And so, um, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's, I think, a lot of having that insight and having that, that hook is a great way to try to, you know, get, get treatment, get them mm-hmm. to adhere and, and participate in treatment stuff. But then, yeah. of course, there's also a lot of them that just don't care. They just do it for fun, mm-hmm. you know, and they do it because it's engaging and interesting and they do the research because of that. Um, but the, 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 it, is, it is always fun to see one who wants to understand really why they're like the way they are and, and how they got that way. And the hope is that we can learn something important by kind of turning to the brain and turning to the brain scan. So but yeah. before you started this, there was like no information about what was going on with psychopaths brains. But you guys had uh, some hypotheses when you started based on there. You know, um, a lot of a lot. Yeah. So there was certainly some candidate brain region. So for example, if you have a lesion in the amygdala or a lesion in a certain, you know, emotional areas of the brain, the patients would develop some symptoms of psychopathy. Mm-hmm. So orbital frontal right above the eyes, you know, the, that area of the brain got damaged. It makes people impulsive. They don't plan well. Um, they can be hot-headed, verbally aggressive, and that's a symptom of psychopathy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you get amygdala lesions, you get people problems with emotional processing and other types of things that we also see in psychopaths. Um, and, and cingulate, anterior cingulate, which is deep in the brain. Lesions there also show similar type of poor anger management and other types of issues that we see. And so it was essentially that neuroscience, neuropsychological literature, of what happens in the brain when you have a lesion or a stroke or something and your behavior changes, that led me to kind of propose that the system, the circuitry that I think is impaired um, in, in psychopaths. Um, and it was really my time at Yale that I spent um, really studying and learning the neuroanatomical 
circuits and systems. And with the breadth of knowledge that was there and talking to all the different neuroanatomists and all different neuroscientists, it really helped me come up with the idea that there is this limbic, paralimbic circuitry that's very different in mm -hmm. psychopaths. And then that led to a lot of new hypotheses and things that we could test about whether or not that system is functioning normally or abnormally um, you know, in, in, in the future studies that we did. So that, that's been the program of research that we've done. And so the idea is that you're going to um, scan psychopaths and have them do tasks that are related to impulsiveness or emotion. So give us an example of kind of one of the tasks you guys have done. Well, yeah, one of, the, one of the more common tasks is that psychopaths make a lot of poor moral decisions. Mm -hmm. And so they don't tend to um, make good moral decisions, if you will. They get themselves in trouble for the mm -hmm. law, for example. And so we've done, uh, we've designed a set of picture stimuli. And this is with Carla Horensky, who's a faculty member in my lab now. And she designed um, three sets of pictures. So some that are just neutral in content, some that are emotional, but non-moral. So they don't mm -hmm. depict a moral scenario. And then some that are emotional and depict a moral scenario. And um, you ask subjects to rate them on their moral content. And it turns out that psychopaths, um, you know, tend to, the, the, so the, the greater the activity in the amygdala in a healthy person, the more they rate the moral stimuli as um, uh, having high moral content. Mm -hmm. And psychopaths don't show that. They don't show that. So whatever the picture induces in a normal person, psychopaths aren't getting that little boost, that little oh. affective kind of circuitry engaging to say that's moral. So basically it's like they know the words but not the music. They can understand um, that that's a moral thing you want me to say that's moral. But the emotion that comes along with it, most of us take get automatically doesn't come to pass. So they're really doing it cognitively, but not emotionally. I see. And, and so that, the idea is like the amygdala is not giving them the emotional information that they need or to, correct, to kind of realize this is important. It's not as responsive. Yeah. And so there's all sorts of ways of trying to engage or train the amygdala, try to respond more like and stuff. But this, in this context, that was the moral decision-making task with the pictures has been, you know, one of the studies we published in, in men and, and, and children or adolescents um, and finding generally that those, those limbic circuits that most of us get engaged automatically are not showing up. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And I mean, the, the fact that you guys are able to do this in adolescence, I think is one of the coolest parts of yeah. the book that you cover, because I think the question that comes up is, you know, where does, obviously we want to reduce psychopathic behavior out there in the world and get folks out of prisons. Um, but there's some hints that psychopathy starts really, really early on. I mean, even in the yeah. diagnosis, right? So talk a little bit about the development of psychopathy. Yeah. So it's, it's not, this, this isn't a condition that magically appears at 25 and you solve a sudden switch from being normal mm -hmm. um, to having all these traits. And so they, they really is a developmental course to the condition. And so what I mean by that is that everybody who's, we study as adults has been very different from an early age. Um, and the parents talk about them as having being different, not necessarily doing group activities or not necessarily engaging in and group sports or engaging with family, et cetera, um, being socially uh, distant, if you will. Uh, they often got in a lot of trouble very early. One of the biggest predictors is, you know, serious antisocial behavior or arrest before the age of 12. Mm -hmm. Some kids, you know, age 8, 9, 10, they're getting in trouble, and they're not necessarily with peers either, all by themselves. And so there is a strong developmental course to the condition. So we wanted to study kids at their first presentation with the legal system. So the first time they get a serious um, you know, charge. We want to study them and understand if, if we can identify the kids that are on the high-risk trajectory versus the low-risk trajectories. Um, and if we can identify the high-risk kids, what could we do to try to treat them? Mm -hmm. or, or how could we try to re reframe it or retreat them to, to reduce the chances that they will continue it as that as adults? So that's why we work with the younger populations to really, when they're more malleable, hopefully, when there's more change, time for plasticity, um, time to help develop things and and, and before they make that big mistake, they get some 30 years in prison, which right. then really not much we'll be able to do then. Um, so that, that's something that we, we have really focused on. And one of the surprising things was that the, the kinds of deficits you saw in limbic function in adults were really mirrored already, even when the patients were like kids or adolescents or much younger, yeah. right? So um, one of the most powerful findings has been that uh, we do an analysis of, of, of brain gray matter or the thinking areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. And we find that psychopaths in the limbic system have about a 5% reduction in gray matter. It's like a muscle. So there's just like a weakened muscle in those emotional areas of the brain. And we found that from, you know, in men, um, in adolescent uh, boys, uh, kind of age 12, 13, 14, we find it also in adolescent girls who are incarcerated. And we have data now, it's not published yet, but in women showing the, exactly the same circuit. So 
it really appears that these traits definitely are associated with um, a, a gray matter reduction or a loss or maybe an atrophy. We don't know exactly how or why it gets that way. Um, and it, it, it transcends gender, age, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we think that it's a, a, a very important target now for helping to develop strategies that might, you know, exercise those circuits, for example, and maybe strengthen them so that that would help to um, make them more resilient to um, the bad influences and the other things and the bad decisions that they make. I mean, that raises this question of whether or not this can ever be treated, right? So one, one interpretation of the adolescent findings is that whatever deficits that are there that are affecting adult psychopaths are there super early on. So, you know, oh, well, their brains are messed up. Can you ever treat them or can you ever heal them? Um, sure. I mean, this is a, a question I know you get from the book a lot, which is like, can we ever get psychopaths to change or are they just psychopaths and yeah, you know, wired I mean, up it, wrong? It, it, it's a great big question. And there, there, in my field, there was been a lot of pessimism throughout mm -hmm. history that they are very untreatable and that most attempts um, by psychodynamic thinkers or uh, early thinkers in the field basically um, often led to, um, if not no effective treatment, sometimes treatment made them worse. Mm -hmm. And so, but what we're really excited about in the field is that there have been, you know, using some of the next generations of treatments, some different types of uh, a treatment, um, cognitive-based treatment, so it's called contingency management, or where you use positive reinforcement techniques rather than punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and those techniques have shown some significant promise, at least in terms of reducing the chances that the the, the youth who go through this program will actually reoffend violently when they get released. And so, so talk a little bit about how much some of those cognitive and behavioral treatments work, because I think they, from your book, it seems like they're kind of counterintuitive with the way most of these kind of juvenile yeah. institutions actually yeah. run things. Well, most of us, I mean, 95% of the world learns through punishment or the fear of punishment to be, to mold, to be molded into socially appropriate behaviors. I mean, you, you anticipate that, you know, if I do something wrong, going to prison, I don't want to go to prison. And that's a, a response that most of us, um, well, frankly, take for granted and assume mm -hmm. the rest of the world should have the same population, should have the same response. But for some individuals, likely those with psychopathic traits, that does not come to pass. They do not in, concerned with or worry about or are, don't anticipate or, or think about fear associated with punishment. So the way that this program in Wisconsin that we've been, we've been collaborating with them now for a couple of years, what they've done is they, they flipped that on its head. So instead of using punishment and things like that to, to try to induce behavioral change, um, they actually use positive reinforcement. So in the kids in maximum security prison who were sent to this facility, um, most of them have been, if you will, compressed. So what that means is They've been um, getting in trouble so much that they get down to the point where they're in solitary confinement. Oh, wow. And then the only thing that actually gets them attention is to be violent. Because if they, um, if they don't do anything, so they're really good and they don't do anything, no one talks to them. Yep. The only thing that happens, the only reason why they get any interaction with someone is if they get in a fight you know, mm -hmm. with the guard or something. So the, what this program does is it says, well, let's start talking with them. And so if they engage and talk to five minutes with the janitor even or somebody, they give them a candy bar. And then the next day they give them other positive reinforcements, all the way up to video games in their cells. So it's called the Today Tomorrow program. If you, if you work with us today, we're going to give you good things tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the kids learn really fast that if they engage and talk and, and, and start taking classes and going back to school in the prisons, mm -hmm. that they start to get all these positive things happening to them. And they like that. And then, and so they, they do more positive behaviors. And so that gets them to start to engage in the treatment process and, and the processes that they want to actually um, uh, utilize. And then what the program really does is it tries to reframe their, their, their thinking so that they're less impulsive. They stop and think. They plan for things. They, they, they realize that if they do plan and they maintain that type of a plan, positive things happen to them. Mm -hmm. And then they start to integrate family again because that's where they're going to be released. And they really do, it takes a year for this to really be effective. But this kind of treatment program actually is the one that has shown over a 50% reduction in violent crime in the kids that complete the program versus the kids in the system as normal. That's great. Um, and that is, that's huge progress. I mean, that's just unbelievably exciting progress. And in a field where, um, you know, so many, you know, people are pessimistic about treatment and there's such a big push in the society generally to just punish the idea that you could treat them. And then, of course, the exciting thing is it saves money. Right, right. Is that if you keep them, you know, if you invest in a treatment program like this and it keeps them from coming back to prison, that saves unbelievable amounts of tax dollars. So we're big fans of this treatment program. And do and we I know like if, it, if it causes neural changes too? Have you been able to do a kind of we before are, and after? Well, 
I would love it if you reviewed my grant. <laughs> we, have a, we have a grant pending right now to try to um, actually study and examine ex exactly that question is how does the, how, we believe that they start out with this neural deficit and what we really want to know is does the program help to, uh, if you will, allow the system to continue to develop or, or, or develop more steeply, get back to normal? Um, do we see that type of change? And we, we do believe since we see such dramatic behavioral change, we should see neural changes, mm -hmm. if not in structure, at least in function, right. um, in the sense of how they process new information would be more uh, adaptive, more consistent with a healthy, uh, you know, non-incarcerated sample. And so we're really encouraged, you know, by the outcomes research that's been done with this program. And we'd like to really be able to show that they are changing neural systems because that gives people hope that that um, it would really, um, it's, re it's really lifelong a a change that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. The, the other thing is it brings up this issue of like how, how we should how we should think about the behavior of these guys like when they're doing it right if they're not morally evaluating it or if they're missing the circuits that are relevant for yeah. thinking about the emotional processing and I, another thing you detail in the book which is super interesting is kind of getting involved in legal cases involving yeah. psychopaths and kind of thinking yeah. about you know should they be punished should they you know how should we think about their responsibility given that they have this. This yeah. trait. So talk a little bit about the history of some of this stuff, because this is not, I mean, you're talking about using brain imaging results to, to deal with these issues, but these are old issues in terms of responsibility. They are. And they are. I mean, um, for the most part, people would just, you know, usually assess and associate, you know, if you're psychopathic or you're, you know, you're like the Hannibal Lecters, the only thing that we should be doing is, is incapacitating you and, and throwing you in prison for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be severely punishing you for anything that you do that is that is bad. But right. when you're when you're a 13 year old offender and you commit some sort of a crime, most of us, mo most people have an appreciation that that's you know might do because you're just immature, and so that you don't you're not making the same decisions you're going to make when you're 30, for example. So if we can uh, leverage that the idea that people are plastic and people change, and we can actually get something you know done with kids then that, I think, leads to the idea that we might be able to uh, prevent them from coming, you know, as, as back as adults. So our, our work is the neuroscience kind of, I think, really shows that their brains are kind of more immature. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, if you have a 25-year-old psychopathic offender, if you look at their brain maturational index, if you will, if we computed something like that, it might look like a 15-year-old's brain. Right. And so what if we were able to give them some sort of a increased maturational process, give them some better? Well, it really does. It prevents crime. I mean, it prevents victims. And so the, the more we can do to help get them to develop and get them to stop, I think that, that just, it's just better for everyone. Mm -hmm. and so, And with respect to the legal system, the legal system you know, treats juveniles very different because they have a different brain, ostensibly, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the legal system... Um, all of a sudden, magically, when you turn 18, though, they treat you extremely differently. And so our, our goal would be to try to, you know, prevent um, or, or develop and, 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 and keep and treat as many as possible before they end up in the adult system. Mm -hmm. But psychopathy traits are, are from a legal perspective, um, some people consider them to be mitigating because they're, you know, if you have a, a brain system that is basically impaired, um, if you want to interpret it that way, um, are you as responsible? Do you have yeah. the same amount of free will as somebody who um, has an intact system? And so this is the classic neuroscience and law kind of dilemmas that this research raises is um, if you have a different brain or and potentially from genetic perspective, is that something that with the legal system should consider mitigating? Right. Or some argue maybe it should be aggravating because your brain is abnormal and maybe that makes you a danger. Right. So maybe we should commit you for treatment, et cetera. Our because you could imagine the argument for psychopaths yeah. going either way. On the one hand, yes, they have these mitigating circumstances, but on yeah. the other hand, they have this deficit, right? They're going to do yeah. this again, and they're going to be really hard to treat and right. get them off the street. Yeah. Right. So, the, so there is that tug and pull. I mean, but for 200 or so years, you know, people have always just assumed it's aggravating. Yeah. And now it's happening. It's as we understand the neuroscience and things, that's led to people making the case that actually maybe it should be mitigating. And that actually tends to, to have a balancing effect on, you know, what how people f work and, and do stuff in the legal system. Again, our hope is really the idea that if you can get progressive governors or people who say that let's implement these big treatments, because really their decision to start it mm -hmm. um, and to fund it, then you could replicate the Mendota program in Wisconsin that we talked about all over the country. In fact, Georgia is just now considering and, and has 
uh, to adopt a similar type of program. And so what if Georgia shows a 50% reduction in, in recidivism, violent recidivism, and the kids that go through their program? Well, that's the best thing. That, that's really, that would really be exciting. So that, that's what we're hoping other states pick this up. And, um, and one of the nice things you kind of chronicle in your book is that at least the, the, the Wisconsin program, I think it is, that you started yeah. with, it's incredibly cost effective, right? Like it's a way to save money to like... Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the cost effectiveness is, is borne out in the first year. And that's because um, the kids stop getting fights in the prison. Mm-hmm. So they stop accumulating additional days, additional sentences, even as kids. So if you get in a fight, you can get like a 90 days added to your sentence. So if you don't get in a fight for a year, you get going to get released earlier. And that saves money because they're not mm-hmm. in prison. But the real cost savings is because the kids don't commit violent crimes. Mm-hmm. And so the rate of recidivism for violent recidivism is close to 45% in the kids that don't go through this program. That's cool. The rate yeah. of violent recidivism in the kids that go through the program is only about 20%. So only about one in six. So that's a 50% reduction in mm-hmm. violent crime. In fact, where the numbers get staggering is that in the 200 kids that they used in the control group, basically kids in the prison is normal, so they're not getting this treatment. They killed 16 people Whoa. In, a, in a four-year follow-up. Whoa. Yeah, and the kids that went through Mendota, even though one out of six of them committed a new violent crime, they didn't kill anyone. So even the type of crime is less. And as mm-hmm. you know... Killing someone is probably one of, is the most expensive crime in the sense that, and I, I don't, not, not yet considering all the emotional toll right, and everything right. like that, but the, the, the system pays the most attention, invests the most dollars to investigate, prosecute, incapacitate, maybe even death sentence. All of those costs are, are not born again on a system. Plus, yeah. people aren't killed. You right, know? right. People are still so alive. The, the, right, big, right. the big picture. So the economics of it are staggering. For every $10,000 the state invested in this program, it returned in a four-year period seventy thousand dollars in cost savings. Wow! So that, if you imagine, you know, doing that, um, it would be huge. It, it would just be an enormous opportunity to redistribute tax dollars to do other things rather than in prisons, mm-hmm. um, because so fewer kids would end up in in that system. Yeah. And if it was adopted at a large scale, that that's a staggering amount of savings. Mm-hmm. I mean, compared to the S and P five hundred over the same period of time, it's four times the cost savings. Wow. You know, like if you invested ten thousand in the stock market, you would have only made about fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars in that period of time. But you would have made seventy thousand if you'd, you know, done this. And of course, they weren't able to compute the emotional toll right. you know, that and the if, families yeah. went through who lost the the homicides and, and and had all those deaths. So to me it's it's just a win win for everyone. Um, and it's it's the best outcome uh, for the child, you know, for the adolescent. And it's the best outcome for society. It's also a nice kind of example of the basic research of understanding the circuitry, making predictions about how we could potentially do treatment, right? Learning right. that the, the emotion system, fear processing is right. kind of where there are deficits. Exactly. Realizing that punishment's not going to work. So this, et that program was the very first in the world to take all of the literature and to create a brand new treatment program that was based on the best science that was available when they developed it a few years ago. And... That is very exciting that they were that they were had the opportunity to do that, and what we're doing now is by scanning the kids' brains as they go through this treatment program, we're hoping to reinform the treatment process. Mm-hmm. So to help them understand um, which processes, which things are changing fastest, which kids might only need six months of treatment versus kids that might need two years of treatment in order to see the same neural change that then mm-hmm. might be predictive of where they end up in the future. And so we're hoping to use the neuroscience to reinform the treatment process and help to continue to make it even better. Because ideally, we'd like to get down to no violent recidivism in the kids. Yeah. But it might just be that the one in six kids that reoffended violently from the program, well, those those might have been the kids that needed two years of treatment, and mm-hmm. the neuroscience might be able to help tell us that. Right. So that that's what we're really interested in doing. That's super cool. And so beyond that, I mean, I think the kind of the treatment goals are awesome. I mean, if you could predict ten years in advance, what are the cool new advances we'll figure out neuroscientifically about psychopaths like? You know, what, 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 would, what do you hope to see 10 years from now? Um, wow, maybe you hope to see, question. no, no, you, you hope to be out of business because there's no adult prisoners. That would be, that would be, then that would be, that would be a very uh, noble, if you will, uh, thing. But I think that it would be lovely to be able to find some sort of, um, uh, you know, understand the genetics and the neural systems at a, at a different level, at a, at a molecular level. And it is so a genetic, might, it does have a genetic component. For me, I think so, know. yeah. yeah. We, I mean, most of the behavioral genetics twin studies would suggest that the traits are, are of similar heritability as, as other types of, of, of clinical conditions like schizophrenia. So about half the variance appears to be shared or from a genetic um, perspective. So 
but if, but if I, in 10 years, I think what I'd love to be able to say is that we understand some of the genetic mechanisms that contribute to these types of behaviors, and therefore we're able to develop um, medicines or other things that augment the behavioral treatment to help make it even better or more stable. And ideally, there'd be medicines that don't have side effects and things like that, that, that really do hopefully um, help reduce the chances that the kids um, uh, you know, don't reoffend or the adults don't reoffend. Um, so that that would probably be one of the biggest things, or really even in the absence of that, to be able to show that the, the juvenile treatment program in Wisconsin, the Mendota juvenile treatment program, actually um, does change brain structure and function, mm -hmm. and then to help to um, advocate that program around the country and to implement and study thousands of kids as they go through that program or similar programs and show that we really do reduce violence um, in society. That'd be the biggest thing I could do. Awesome. Well, that we I look forward to coming back to you 10 years from now and being back on Blogging Heads where you could tell us, tell us about the progress of all of that stuff. Well, um, I would love to. In the meantime, everybody who's listening should check out Kent's awesome book, uh, Psychopath Whisperer. Um, we didn't get to all the kind of crazy prison stories you have about psychopaths and their behavior. Save those for the, for the book. Save those, those for the book. book. Yeah. Um, but thanks so much for joining us. We'll hope to have you back soon. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. Thanks so much.